the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> Dean Paul, will you teach me how to do that? <laughs> Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. It is a joy to be here tonight, such a privilege to be here on this, the 10th anniversary of the Anglican Church in North America. Thank you, Christ Church Plano, for hosting our assembly and for helping us plan this great occasion. I'd also like to say a special welcome to our international guest and our ecumenical guest. Uh, these men are literally he modern heroes of the faith. So many of them have taken courageous and bold stands for the gospel to the point where their lives have actually been on the line. So thank you for honoring us with your presence this night. It is absolutely amazing to see how the hand of the Lord has led us, not only in the formation of this province, but in the 10 years since. Thousands of lives have been transformed with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hundreds of churches have been planted. Many of the poor and needy all over North America have been helped with creative and innovative ministry projects. Hundreds of missionaries have been sent to places around the world. And within all the pressures of everyday ministry, we have somehow made the time to publish and revise a new catechism and create and publish an incredible book of common prayer. The Lord has motivated his people to give sacrificially of their resources, not only to provide for the ministries of their local parishes, but for missions all around the world for the poor and the hungry and the needy, for numerous new building projects, for church planting and ministry to young people, for the actual running of the province and for the Anglican Relief and Development Fund. It's really quite amazing, actually miraculous, when you actually think about all that has happened in these 10 years. To God be all praise and all glory. Amen. I do not believe it's a coincidence that the ACNA was founded around the nativity of John the Baptist. When I hear the prophetic words of Zechariah regarding the ministry of John the Baptist, it seems that we have been put in such a role as well. The call to repentance, the call to reform, the, the call to return to the teaching of the Word of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. John, the forerunner of the Messiah, called on people to turn from their sins and repent. Matthew 3, 1, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John found out that those in power don't like to hear the call to repent or to change or to return to the Lord's word. But those who did repent they found the Lord, they encountered the Messiah, and their lives were changed for all eternity. As we begin our second decade as a province, those of us here this week will hear about being disciples and making disciples of Jesus. We are blessed to have with us incredible servant leaders in God's church to speak to us and to lead us. I hope you will take advantage of this rare opportunity and like a sponge, soak up their teaching and encouragement to follow Jesus' admonition to go and make disciples. Our calling as believers is not to plant churches, as good as that is. Our calling as believers is not to lead incredible worship, as good as that is. Our calling is not to publicly stand for what is right, as good as that is. Our calling is not to grow churches as good as that is. Our calling from Jesus is to go and make disciples. Jesus calls each of his followers to be about this business of disciple-making, helping others follow Jesus as he leads them in their lives. When a person is born again or born of the Spirit, she or he is literally like a baby born into this world. 
A baby has to be cared for, loved, fed, cleaned, disciplined, and nurtured until such a time that she or he can walk on their own. The kingdom of God is similar. We need to be taught how to walk the walk. How do you worship? How do you pray? How do you read and study the Bible? How do you hear the Lord? How do you love your neighbor? What do the scriptures say about Jesus or about serving or about what is right or what is wrong? How do I walk in the Holy Spirit when the bottom drops out in my life? This is what discipleship does. It cooperates with the Holy Spirit to help us follow Jesus in the midst of our life situation. Many have tried to turn discipleship into a class or a course we attend. And as good as these courses might be, discipleship is caught, not just taught. It's a lifestyle which is modeled and shared in living life together. I am so grateful for all the individuals over the years who have walked with me and discipled me, sharing their lives, their families, their wisdom, their knowledge of God. Over the years, I have had many, many people disciple me and mentor me. I think of Bill Murray. As a new follower of Jesus, he would meet with me once a week and teach me how to study the Bible and how to talk to God. I think of Danny Parker. Getting my feet wet in youth ministry, he taught me how to love high school students in a manner in which they would know it, how to go where they were, how to reach out in Christ's love and care, how to speak biblical truth into their lives, and how to pray with them to receive Jesus. I think of Dan DeHaan, who not only met with me weekly for Bible study, but he taught me how to seek God for God himself, not just for what he can give me, how to love God, not just love what he does for me. I think of David Chamberlain, who mentored me in the Anglican faith, and David Collins, who taught me about this thing called church and the release and the power of the Holy Spirit in doing one's ministry. These men are just a few of the many who have discipled and mentored me and helped me to follow Jesus in my life situation throughout the years. They gave of their time, their resources, their very lives to help me be a better follower of Jesus. John the Baptist was quite a disciple maker as well. He reminds us of several things about discipleship. He reminds us of discipleship when he speaks that repentance is a lifestyle, not just a one-act play. In Matthew 3, 1, we're told that he went into the wilderness of Judea preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And people were coming to be baptized as an outward sign of their repentance. And then what did John say to them? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. In, in other words, following God is just not about getting wet or being part of a certain family tree. It's about living a life that exhibits the character of the God we follow. Discipleship is a lifestyle of continual repentance. It's a constant turning away from the ways of the world which have so encroached into our very being and following after the Messiah, Jesus himself. John the Baptist also reminds us of discipleship when he speaks about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In Matthew 3, 11, he says this, I baptize you with water, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now, of course, we know now that he was referring to what, what happened on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out on those first followers of Jesus and how they were empowered to follow him in their lives and their ministries. But discipleship is following Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit. Day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute, following Jesus in the power of the Spirit. The problem is that too often and too many times, the ways of the world, the flesh, and the devil knock us off course, and we sin. 
The amazing thing is that because of what Jesus did on the cross, he serves as an advocate with the Father for us, and he forgives us of our sins when we confess them. 1 John 1, 9 says if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When we do this, the Holy Spirit is renewed in us, continually filling us and guiding us as we follow Jesus. Discipleship is following Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit. John also reminds us of discipleship when he points to Jesus as the one to follow. Remember in John 135, John the Baptist is preaching and he sees Jesus walking by and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God. Two of his disciples heard him say this and they followed Jesus. And John's attitude about all this can be summarized later when we read in John 3.30. He says, he, meaning Jesus, he must increase, I must decrease. And this is an element of true discipleship. The disciple is oriented toward Jesus in all aspects of her life. Jesus increases, the disciple decreases. Or to make it more personal, Jesus increases self decreases again this is a lifestyle and something which is learned over time as one faces the challenges and the storms of life while we follow Jesus we look to Jesus he increases in us and through us and self and selfishness decrease his fruit his love his joy his patience his peace become more and more a part of my very being. <laughs> John the Baptist also reminds us of another aspect of, a disciple, of discipleship. He gives his all for the Lord. He gives his all for the Lord. As you know, John the Baptist did not have a problem speaking to those in authority, even pointing out their personal sins, calling King Herod a fox and calling him out with his adultery did not win him many favors with the king it eventually cost him his head his prophetic discipleship led to his martyrdom and this is where we often get stuck we're willing to follow Jesus 80% or 90% but we keep holding on to something and we refuse to let go God, you can have everything, but, but not this. Jesus, I will follow you anywhere, but, but I'm not going there. Jesus, don't ask me to forgive so-and-so because I'm not going to do it. John the Baptist was willing to give it all, and it didn't matter what it cost him. He laid it all on the line. Jesus spoke of him in Luke 7:30. 7, excuse me, Luke 7, verse 28, when he said, I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John. Discipleship involves following Jesus with everything we are and everything we have. And all those, this is a process of becoming a reality in our lives. It's true discipleship. Lord, I'm yours, and everything I have is yours. I'm here to follow you, no matter what. So what have we said? Discipleship is a way of living. Discipleship involves not just what is taught, but what is caught by sharing life together. Discipleship is a lifestyle of continual repentance. Discipleship is following Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit. Discipleship is pointing to Jesus. Discipleship is laying it all on the line for the sake of Jesus. A few months ago, I listened to a brother in Christ share about his ministry with prisoners. He works with serious and violent offenders, those who we really couldn't even talk to. He made an astonishing statement, which I'm still struggling with. He said this, he said about 95% of the men have sat in churches in their younger years and have prayed the sinner's prayer. 95% of the serious and violent offenders he has worked with, he said, had sat in church and actually prayed the sinner's prayer. 
What happened? Why didn't it take? Could it be that they were never discipled? Could it be that no one ever invested their walk in their walk with the Lord and they never became a disciple? Could it be that no one ever cared enough to spend time with them and teach them how to walk the talk in the kingdom of God? They had made a decision for Christ, but they had never become a disciple of Christ. I often wonder about all the de-churched people around us in our communities. Here in the South, there are probably more de-churched people than unchurched people. Many of these folks have heard the gospel so much that they have developed immunity to it. Why? Why? Could it be that we have been so focused on doing church that we've not loved folks enough to disciple them? Sisters and brothers in Christ, you and I are living in an unprecedented time in human history, a time of opportunity where the harvest truly is plentiful. So my word tonight is let's get with it. Let's get on with it. Let's go and make disciples of Jesus Christ. But first, let's be disciples of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Lord, most of the people in this congregation tonight truly want to be your disciple. I ask that you would show us how to do that in the world in which we live. Not only help us be disciples, but help us be your people of disciple makers in our world in which we live. Send us forth from this place, from this assembly, uh, with the ability to disciple the folks that we encounter. May you use us to reach our generation for you. And this is our prayer in the name of Jesus and for his glory. Amen.